those creatures. Listen. The author describes the sounds. The moon had risen, round and gleaming behind the fields. A silvery mist hovered over the ground in the shimmering waters. The frogs croaked, and in the meadows the melodious fluting of the toads arose. The shrill tremolo of the grasshoppers seemed to answer the twinkling of the alders. From the hills above the river there came down the sweet, light song of the nightingale. What need is there to sing, sighed Gottfried after a long silence. Don't they sing sweeter than anything you could make? The wisdom of poor Uncle Gottfried is shown by the greatest among composers who never attempt to compete with the exquisite compositions engendered in the throats of birds. Bird songs have often served as inspiration to composers, and some of the early masters pretended imitations of a few less intricate bird calls, but even these are unnecessarily stylized, restricted by the limitations of instruments as well as of musical notation. Beethoven himself had to indicate in the score of his pastoral symphony the three birds he meant to represent at the close of the second movement, the nightingale, the quail, and the cuckoo. But Beethoven could never hear the songs of birds, aside from his deafness, as we're going to hear them during the next few minutes. The actual songs of a number of species, recorded on discs and tape, from the library of the Albert R. Brand Bird Song Foundation in the Laboratory of Ornithology at Cornell University. Professor Peter P. Kellogg, Professor of Ornithology at Cornell, and his colleague, Professor A. A. Allen, very kindly allowed me to re-record some of the bird songs for broadcast on your invitation to music this afternoon. You'll hear familiar songs, but you'll hear also some strange and enchanting sounds. One of the most celebrated vocalists on this continent is familiar enough to you who live in the southern states, but to me, being a New Englander, it's quite novel. The Mockingbird, who mimics not only the calls of other birds, like our catbird in New England, but the songs of his environment as well. So his song is varied and not always musical to our ears. Here's the Mockingbird that Floridians can hear all night long on moonlight nights. He's the state bird of Florida, by the way, the mockingbird. Sounds musical to me, ingenious improvisations. The little fellow we'll hear next may not be as beautiful as the dignified appearing mockingbird with his pale gray and white evening dress, even to the long tail feathers. But his song, you may find even more appealing. He's the cinnamon colored, stubby tailed winter wren, tiny little bird and he loves the northern regions and cold climate. The winter wren's a deceptive little creature because as soon as you spot him, he puts on a disappearing act and usually makes for the inside of a pile of brush. But his song is remarkably complex. Listen to this. This song of the winter wren is so rapid, you can't possibly distinguish the intervals. But there are 130 notes in that call. And the highest are 8,000 cycles per second, roughly an octave above the highest note on the piano. Let's try an experiment with this complicated song of the winter wren. We'll play this tape recording at half speed. So it takes twice as long, and the notes are brought down a full octave. See if the pitches don't become more perceptible to you at this half speed. It's 
still pretty rapid. 130 notes in 15 seconds over eight separate notes per second. Would you like to hear how it sounds at an even slower speed? It may not be very bird-like, but the individual notes would stand out even more clearly. Here's the Winter Wren song brought down two octaves and spread out to three times its normal duration, played at one quarter speed. like expert whistling. I love that plaintive little slur at the end, hardly noticeable at normal speed. And how different even the, the tone quality sounds from the original. It has a sweet gentleness about it in contrast to the spiciness of the original song. Let me play them one after the other so you can compare them. First at quarter speed and then as the bird sings naturally. That's the Winter Wren, recorded in the Adirondacks. From the sublime to the ridiculous, from the cheerful little Winter Wren, to the common loon, the laughing loon. This fellow lives in the Adirondacks too. He's calling from one of the lakes. Crazy as a loon? He had a companion with him there, too. Did you notice how one low note at the end of his call sounds like a recorder? Sounds like end of the sentence, that's all. <laughs> the bird comedian seemed to love the lakes and marshes. Haven't you heard this witty dialogue, uh, monologue, off in the distance when you're plowing through marshy regions? He calls himself the pied billed grebe and he sings a duet with himself, contralto and baritone together. It's quite a feat. It's very difficult to isolate a single bird call when you're recording in the field, but I think Professors Kellogg and Allen achieved some uh, really remarkable results in their collection at Cornell. They've experimented so long that finally they've devised a way to record a bird song several hundred yards away from the bird and in doing so to eliminate interfering or undesired sounds or at least to to uh, keep them way down in the background unless another bird is in the direct line of vision with the one you want to record here's an interesting example of that a meadow lark an eastern meadow lark which was the object of their interest at the moment in duet with a red-winged blackbird which is apparently directly behind the meadow lark in the line of focus. This is one of the recordings, by the way, you'll find in their long playing records in the music shops, volumes one and two called North American Bird Calls. Listen to this one. It's the meadow lock you hear first, and then almost immediately, the ascending arpeggios of the red winged blackbird. The western meadowlark has a more elaborate song. You who live in the Middle West, in the Mississippi River area, have heard both the eastern and western meadowlarks very often together in the same fields. It's an enchanting song, the western meadowlark.
Here's one of the friendliest little fellows now, and he always seems to be singing just for your benefit. You see him all over the United States, coast to coast, in Canada, and even as far north as the Alaska coast. Can't fail to recognize him, the modest little song sparrow. hard to distinguish the actual pitches of this cheerful little sequence of notes. Wonder what it would sound like played at half speed, down an octave. This is it. Still sounds pretty complex. Do we dare cut the speed in half again? One quarter speed, two octaves down? Seems to be a succession of unrelated notes, at least by any scale we know. And the notes have different timbres, different tone qualities. Maybe one more halving of the speed would clarify it for our limited human ears. One eighth speed, three full octaves below the original. It should take uh, 24 seconds to play. Notice that peculiar sound at the end, the very end, this. He holds one note and flutters on a higher one. The D flat, the, the lower one, is sustained, and a flutter, like a flute flutter, on the higher note, G flat. Listen again. Would you ever know that such complicated sounds would be found in this song? It's best, after all, the gentle song sparrow. The absurdity of Siegfried's learning the language of the birds doesn't seem so absurd. That must be easy to understand, what the song sparrow is saying to the world, so openly, so sweetly. Have a brave heart, part of what he's saying, I think. Did you ever hear this sound? Cricket frogs. The microphone is right down there among them in the bog. And Professor Kellogg tells me the noise there is deafening, a real ear smasher. That's enough. Sounds like a thousand castanets in your ear. That one's contained in a, a record volume called Voices of the Night, the calls of some 20 frogs and toads in eastern North America, like this one. Chorus of cricket frogs, punctuated by the bass of a bullfrog, and joined also by a southern toad, and way off in the distance, a barking frog. It sounds like a hound barking far away. Hear the barking frog in the distance? From the ridiculous to the sublime, and from the noisy swamp to the deep, quiet wood, and that incomparably beautiful voice of the thrush. Flute-like, it's described, but it's much richer than that, it seems to me, for all its purity. Here's the wood thrush. You often hear him sing close by and then be answered by another thrush off in the distance. Notice how he starts each of his arpeggios at the beginning of the call in a different key, going higher in the scale each time and then descending again. Here he starts low a series of calls, all variations, no two alike. To show the marvelous improvisations of the thrush, the endless variety of his song, let's hear it at half speed, an octave lower.
no instrument you can compare it with, the complexity of the song and the rich fullness of the voice itself. Here it's reduced in speed again to one quarter. Notice the, the, uh, the weird background sounds. Of course, all the other birds you hear are singing four times slower too, and uh, two octaves lower than normal. Gives an eerie effect, like sounds in the tropics. Listen. And now, a weird but enchanting sound new to human ears. Professor Kellogg and I tried this in the laboratory as an experiment. The, the sound of the wood thrush played at one-eighth speed. We were so fascinated by the results that we recorded it. If a person heard what you'll hear now without being told beforehand what it is, I doubt if he'd ever be able to tell what produces the music. last note is really three notes. It's a chord, a triad, with the lowest note sustained while the two upper notes are trilled. Listen to it. There's just one more bird call I'd like you to hear before we stop. It's my own favorite, the hermit thrush. Not so powerful, but even more varied than the wood thrush. This is his song. and slowed to half speed, the complexities of his motif appear even more marvelous to the human ear. Yes, Uncle Gottfried was right. Don't they sing sweeter than anything you could make? For the privilege of broadcasting for you this program of bird songs, my sincere appreciation to Professor Peter P. Kellogg, who allowed me to select them from the Albert R. Brand Birdsong Foundation in the Laboratory of Ornithology at Cornell University.